Thank you all for coming. It always seems like short notice when we call upon you, and I'm grateful for that, you for coming. The reason for the press conference, of course, is the taping of confidential senior staff meetings by my former priest secretary and vice chancellor of the diocese related to ongoing investigations of several individuals. And this relates to a very, very complex and convoluted matter that I want to explain to you personally. And I'm using notes more than I ordinarily would because the situation can be very confusing and I don't want to confuse it any worse than it may already be. First of all, let me explain the key persons involved in this whole situation. First of all is Matthew Bozhanovsky. I think he usually says Bozhanovsky. A former seminarian until very recently at Christ the King Seminary in the pre-theology program. That's the very first year or two of their formation. He sent in a letter with several concerns about Father Jeffrey Nowak. And that letter arrived on the 28th day of January of this year. And it went to the Office of Professional Responsibility where investigations ensue uh, on the, I think it was the 8th of February. And that's when the process began to move forward. This was about primarily claims of sexual harassment and violation of the seal of confession. You know, in the Catholic Church, it's a very strong principle that no priest can ever, under any circumstances, even danger of death, reveal what is told to him in the sacrament of penance when people go to confession. To this date, that remains unproven. You cannot canonically simply accuse someone of violation of the seal of confession, which is a very serious charge, without giving some indication. It doesn't have to reveal a particular sin confessed, but some indication was something said, that something happened that's a direct result. And uh, we, uh, two candidates I've consulted have assured me that unless there's something indicated to validate the claim, then the claim really uh, does, not, uh, <clears throat> does not hold much credibility. But we continue to look at all of this. We continue to look at it, it's so important. Um, so, Mr. Bozhanowski participated in an initial interview with Mr. Steve Halter uh, early in the spring, and he has been invited to participate in further investigation to explore some of the questions so as to provide specific details to his claims. In particular, how was the seal of confession violated. It's a very serious concern, which I would take very seriously. And to date, he has not participated in those further invitations to bring clarity. Hopefully, he might in the future. The second individual is Father Jeffrey Nowak. He is pastor of Our Lady Help of Christians Parish in Chitawaga, currently on administrative leave. And the claims were made against him by Matthew Boschanowski. And during the whole, that part of the investigation, uh, a question arose about the existence of a letter. And I'll talk about that a little more, a little further on. A letter he had in his possession. I'm going to come back to it, so don't be frustrated that I'm, I'm not dealing with it. Um, and so Father Nowak this, uh, was asked in December for this letter, which purportedly he had in his possession. And we found out eventually he did. But he lied to me when I met with him about that and said no, he no longer had that letter. Apparently he had taken a picture of the letter on his phone and then said he had deleted it. So all of these things and others went to the Office of Professional Responsibility that I established last year. Um, and uh, Father Nowak was interviewed for three days in May uh, for over six hours about all of these kinds of things. And then in that context, he finally produced the letter that he told me he no longer possessed. Um, it was determined then that Father Nowak needed to go for a sort of a behavioral assessment. We have several institutes that we, we, we call upon to send people who we think need some kind of evaluative process uh, to 
help us decide what we can do to help those folks move forward. Sometimes they'll ask them after a few days of, <coughs> excuse me, the evaluation, they'll ask them to stay longer for treatment. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it does not. Um, so he was removed from ministry until he would go for that assessment. He first agreed to do that in July to a place called Saint, the St. Luke Institute, which has been around for many, many years, and he did not comply. He took several days, uh, took us several days to get in touch with him. So in the beginning of August, I don't mean to confuse you with all these dates, but the timeline is important. At the beginning of August, Father Nowak said he would go, and he, then he backed out on that. Then he was given a third opportunity to go for assessment on the 25th of August. And once again, for a third time, he did not go, and that is when I put him on administrative leave, which means he cannot at this time function or present himself as a priest. So the issues here um, are concerns for the seal of confession, which we'll continue to, uh, to uh, try and uh, understand more carefully. Um, perhaps boundary issues and or other kinds of inappropriate behavior, all of these kinds of things. And an assessment, we feel, has been our experience, an assessment, especially the ones done these days, would hopefully reveal if he or any person was dealing with relationship issues, which would then help us to determine um, how to work with Father moving forward. So that's person number two. And here comes person number three. And that is Father Richard Bernat, who was a priest of the Diocese of Buffalo, came to us from Poland, and for the past six years has been the secretary to me, the priest, what we call the priest secretary to the bishop and also vice chancellor. Uh, being vice chancellor, Sister Regina Murphy is the chancellor, and uh, Father was the vice chancellor. Currently, he is on not administrative leave, but a personal leave of absence, which any priest can uh, be asked to consider or can request for himself. And Matthew Bozhanovsky developed a friendship with Father Richard while Matthew was discerning himself going into the seminary during that period a few years ago. And a key piece here of this whole scenario is that Father Richard composed a letter to Matthew in 2016. And that letter has come to light and is, we know, circulating among some of you in the media and in our community. How it got out there like that is a mystery to us, but we know it did. The content of that letter, if you've seen it, is a bit concerning. And that is why I suggested that Father Richard should go on a personal leave of absence for a while. And the purpose of that, in my own thoughts, was to provide him some time apart from his work with me. His work with me was really all-encompassing in so many, many ways. Um, so the issue here is the letter from Father Richard to, to Matthew. And I do have to say, without focusing on this myself, um, Father Richard's actions, for whatever reason, in, in um, providing those tapes of what are meant to be the highest level of confidential, sensitive discussions among my senior team, uh, that this really is a serious breach of confidentiality uh, for someone to do that. And Father is a member of the diocesan curia, which means the highest level of leadership with me, and uh, has actually broken uh, church law in doing that. Now, how are these persons involved? Let me give you context now. Father Nowak was the parochial vicar previously at St. John Vianney Parish, where he, in Orchard Park, where he met Matthew. Matthew's family belongs to that parish, I believe. And Father Nowak began mentoring Matthew, who was a discerning of vocation then to the priesthood. And that developed into what appeared to be a pretty deep friendship between the two of them. And um, Matthew then later met Father Richard Bernat. Okay? 
And as that relationship developed with Father Richard and Matthew, Matthew's relationship with Father Nowak cooled, you might say. That's probably a good word for it. And this was disturbing to Father Nowak. You see the complexity of this whole thing. And that letter was sent, uh, rather, rather, Father Nowak secretly photographed that letter that he found in Matthew's apartment in Boston when he was visiting there. This is all several years ago. Um, the letter was sent by Father Richard Bernard to Matthew. And Matthew later wrote to me, accusing Father Nowak of harassment and several other allegations that I've already mentioned. I'm getting toward the end here, then it's your time to hear your questions. Now, Father Richard has served as my personal secretary, as well as vice chancellor of the diocese, been a member of my senior staff uh, since the time he arrived here. I'm not, not arrived here, here in the States, but arrived in my, in my office. So his release of, of information from a very sensitive and very always very confidential senior discussion, where we talk about the most sensitive matters, I have to say was a, truly a disappointment to me as well as a, a breach of his canonical obligations at his level in the work of the diocese. He was recently issued a canonical warning and asked to take a personal leave of absence in order to take some time to discern. He was still allowed to celebrate Mass. I did not suspend that or anything. Until last week, I think he was still living in the residence. I didn't see much of them, but he was there. He and I had lived together at Oakland Place, and then when we sold Oakland Place to get money for the Victims Fund, we, we moved into, we leased the old convent at St. Stan's Parish uh, in the Broadway Fillmore District, and we both lived there in that house. Uh, and we both prayed together many, many days and uh, enjoyed much conversation together uh, during, during all of that time. So the relationship of these three men is very, complicated. Um, they have leveled, in one way or another, accusations among themselves, which needed intense investigation. And as I say, that investigation continues. Uh, none, of, none of the individuals have been totally forthcoming or cooperative. And that's one of the reasons that this thing has taken as long as it has. Plus all the other investigations uh, we've been doing during this past year of um, allegations of abuse of children, of minors. We had many of those cases, as you know, uh, during the past year. Now, uh, this compromising letter, as some have called it, from Father Richard to Matthew was alluded to by several people, but when I asked to see it, as I mentioned, I was told by Father Nowak that his lawyer had it. And then, after two months, Father Nowak finally gave us that letter. And the letter uh, could be perceived as reflecting what you might call an inappropriate relationship between Matthew and Father Richard, as some have noted. I say that because I've heard that from uh, several, several people, not people on my staff, but people, Catholics in the diocese. Uh, Matthew has accused Father Nowak of harassment. Matthew sent me a letter, that's just summary now, and emails that he had received from Father Nowak. And those were emails back and forth between the two of them, it should be noted. And those also could suggest, could suggest that there was something inappropriate there going on on the part of Father Nowak. So you see the, I hope, the remarkable complexity of this whole situation that we've been dealing with and, um, and the time that's required for uh, full and thorough investigation, which we have to do. Uh, we owe the individuals involved, whatever their part in the whole scene, we owe them a thorough and careful investigation according to the norms and protocols of church law and any other norms and law that would come into the picture. So that, that's uh, really my little introduction here for you, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer 
the best I can and with your questions. Bishop, with all due respect, you have not addressed what was heard in those audio files in that you referred to Noah uh, as a sick puppy, as dangerous, and people now feel that you have lied about the policy that you told the community you were following that if someone had a credible accusation that they would not be allowed to be in ministry, and yet he was. How do you respond to that? Well, they, I understand the, the, the question, but there is a response to it. I'm happy to have the chance to, to, to make to make that. First of all, you know, if any any of you, any of us who have had discussions in what we believe is a totally confidential environment with our closest colleagues, sometimes we'll use language that we would not use in public. For example, uh, there, there was a lot of frustration in trying to sort out this thing with Father Noah. And if you looked at some of the content that Father that Matthew Bozianowski uh, wrote to us about that described some of the language and behavior of Father Novak. You see, it was very frustrating trying to get a hold of all of that uh, kind of kind of a situation. So, sick puppy was not a very. I was just getting frustrated. If I were talking to the media, I would say a man with some issues. You know, but when you're with people you meet with every week about these things. You can kind of let your frustration out, let your hair down, and uh, not, not, a, not, a, not a, uh, a word I would ordinarily use. Um, and to say he was dangerous, I didn't mean that in the sense of someone who I, I thought had the potential of the risk to harm somebody, go out there and do some damage to someone. Um, I was concerned, I remember that, and my staff helped me to remember it even more clearly. We were concerned at that time about the effect that the letter that Father um, Nowak had, that was a letter from Father Richard to Matthew, could have, in terms of possible scandal, on people, on the diocese, if it would raise all kinds of questions. That, that's really what I meant by that word. It wasn't, it was not meant to suggest that this is a person who is a risk. So that's why he wasn't immediately uh, removed and put on administrative leave. You don't think he's a dangerous Possible abuser to others out there? Well, I, 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 like, I hope he's not, but I, I don't have indication that it's at that level, but that's why an evaluation by competent professionals is so important. Bishop, Michael, you know, Bishop, we'll just, we'll because now there have been two members of your very innermost circle who have decided to go public with what it is that they know. Should the people of the Buffalo Diocese have questions about your judgment as to who you surround yourself with, and should they have further questions as to whether or not you're suitable to remain in the position that you are, Bishop of the Buffalo Diocese? Thank you for the question. I understand where that would come from. Uh, first of all, I was very thoughtful and did lots of consultation in my choice of the two individuals you just referenced one who had been my executive assistant and the other my uh, priest, we call priest secretary. And in that job, he most re mostly responsible for logistics of my ministry and uh, helping me with ceremonies and many, many other things like that. And uh, both of these individuals came very highly recommended to me. And so I, I, don't, I don't feel my judgment was, was, uh, was, was faulty. Uh, th things, things emerged, things began, showed up later that uh, made me wonder what I had missed when we were doing the interviews and all of that. But uh, no, I don't. And I also don't feel that, that it's time for me to move on. I've said that from the beginning. Um, as a woman said to me coming out of church last month, she said, Bishop, do you know the, the, the things you need to do better? You've often mentioned that. But she said, please don't think you have to be the lightning rod for 50 or 60 years of bad, bad behavior by priests that came before you ever got here. And I try to remember that, and I feel an obligation as the bishop of this diocese to, to do all the best I can working with other people, including a lot of laity, to move, up, move us forward uh, toward a restoration of trust. Well, bishop, there's, there's a growing even number of priests in the diocese who have lost faith in How, how, I can, how do you effectively lead the diocese right now when even some of your priests don't have 
confidence in your leadership? Well, you know, I can tell you from what I know, and I just, ha I just held a meeting of most all of the priests last Wednesday, and uh, there, there's much more, and you can ask, I can give you names of ones. I, I think the ones who would like to see me move on are truly the minority. And I know that's not wishful thinking, because other priests have told me that. Priest told me just the other day, most of us are with you, Bishop. Seminarians tell me the same thing. Does it mean all of them are? No. But I feel very good with my priests. I'm very open and candid with them. Um, just like I'm doing Q&A with you folks today, I do that with my priests and my deacons and others in ministry. And I give them straightforward and honest answers. So I, if I felt like a majority of my clergy felt I could no longer properly lead the diocese with them, because the bishop does not lead by himself, or he's a poor leader, um, then I'd have to rethink my, my commitment. Bishop, do you worry that by staying on as bishop, it's going to affect the finances of the diocese even more? We've been focusing, say, on the, the appeal every year that's been having its struggles. Less people are wanting to donate each week when they go to church. Do you worry that by staying on, it's going to affect it even more than it has over the last couple of years? Well, I, of course I have a concern about that. But we know that the, uh, the I, let me just back up for a minute. I want you to know that I fully understand the rage and the dismay and perhaps the incredulity and lack of trust that so many people in the community, not only Catholics, feel. And I may be a part of that because I'm the bishop currently, but it's, a lot of it is the weight of decades of bad, bad things that some priests did. And so I accept that. And I think if I can accept that and try to move on and try to work with the folks who are so committed to restoring trust and all of that, that we can turn, we can turn this around. Um, and sometimes, uh, by the way, and I don't say this defensively, I hope I don't come across that way, but uh, every single week, um, my office folks can tell you I receive all kinds of letters and notes from people encouraging me and thanking me. So it's not as, uh, there are those who'd like to uh, you know, ride me out of town, I, I get that. But there are lots of other people who actually say, and even at the listening sessions, thank me for, uh, for hanging in there. Bishop, you've um, already indicated that the most recent events don't really change your stance on possible resignation, but what about dialysis and bankruptcy? What is, what is your stance on that? Well, you know, the Child Victims Act as you know, I'm sure, no, most people know all these things before I say them, but it, it, it applies to all eight dioceses of New York State. And the bishops have frequent conference calls or meetings among ourselves. And we're all, I don't want to speak for all eight, but I know I'm not the only one right now who feels like I'm standing at a crossroads, analyzing where we are with our resources, because we've already spent over 18 million for the Independent Reconciliation and Compensation Program. We felt we couldn't do a, a part two of that, at least right now, because we needed to have funds left now to work with the Child Victims Act, uh, uh, people who were so tragically uh, hurt and abused over, over many, many decades. So um, the, uh, the fact of the matter is that I have been in dialogue both with attorneys who would argue, and others, who would argue for litigation. Um, and to do that, of course, we have to know, because our resources are limited, we have some, but we have to know that we have insurance coverage for some of the periods when abuse happened. And that can be a challenge to work that out. I learned a whole new term recently with something called insurance archaeology. Simply meaning, uh, even pastors are told there might have been a time when your parish had its own insurance instead of through the diocese. So go down into the basement, go up into the attic, and see whatever kind of insurance documentation you can find, because if you've had an abuse case there and the parish is being sued, there may be insurance coverage for that case during that season. So we're, we're looking at litigation and at the possibility of bankruptcy, or Chapter 11 reorganization, as we like to use a euphemism for it, which is, as you know, a structure and strategy that uh, helps the mission of the church to go forth, forth securely. Um, so we're, right now, that's the honest truth. We're looking at both of those um, very, very closely and carefully. And I have not yet made a decision. There are people 
arguing both both positions. You've admitted that you are a controversial figure in the community and in the church. Uh, talk about, don't you think that just your mere presence as the figurehead of, as the leader of the church in Buffalo, that that would lead the church in the wrong direction with so much extremism on both sides in their opinions? Another, another insightful question. Uh, that's something, that's a gauge, of course, I have to keep my eye on, any bishop does under any circumstances. But uh, no, I, I still feel strong, I mean, I, I'm not a masochist, you know what I mean? I'm not a person who stays in something because I enjoy uh, pain and all of that. I'm here because I feel an obligation as the one who was sent here to lead this diocese to, to carry on. And uh, once again, if I thought that the majority of Catholic people in particular um, were calling for my resignation, that would be a different story. Um, but I don't feel that. I go out to parishes and schools all the time for visits. Um, you know, I am always well received when I go. Who knows what some people's thoughts are sitting there in the pews that they don't articulate. But I, I do feel enough support, honestly, uh, to continue on. Um, I, will be, I will be 75 in March of 2021. And it's on his 75th birthday that a bishop, by church law, must submit his resignation to the Pope. And the Pope can take as long as he wants to accept that resignation. Um, so right now, I'm, I'm going a day at a time, and I'm trusting in my, my God, trusting in my own prayer, and uh, in, the, in the good people around me. And we've been doing some, I think, very good initial work with the movement to restore trust, which is a strong call, not only to get through this crisis, but to reform the church, especially by more significant roles for lay women and lay men. Speaking of the Pope, uh, what have you heard? Of whom, I'm sorry, James? Speaking of the Pope, the Pope, what have you heard from the Vatican on both your handling of uh, child sex abuse cases and on these more recent golf cases? Well, we, you know, the Pope, uh, they say the Pope frequently picks up the phone and calls people around the world, but I have not been the recipient of one of those calls. I, I've had no communications from the, from the Pope at all. Not, I, not I, necessarily I, the Pope, but <coughs> Well, I, 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 I keep in contact uh, with the Apostolic Nuncio, who, as you know, is kind of like the Pope's ambassador in each country. Uh, I've had conversations with him. When something is brewing, I try to give, all with Cardinal Dolan, who is the Metropolitan Archbishop of New York, of the whole state, uh, and keep them abreast of things and answer questions they have. Have, have they said to you, you must stay? No. What, what they've, they they've neither said you must stay nor you must leave. And so, and I know for sure they're not unaware, you know, of all the news around here. Um, but so far, apparently, I, I like to think they are trusting uh, trusting in my goodwill and my intention and my capacity, working with other people to lead us, to lead us forward. Mr. Malone, but if I get a call from the Pope, maybe I'll let you know, because you hear about that. <laughs> Mr. Malone, I'd like to reiterate the subject of transparency. You've been talking about that over and over again. By telling us this story of the, of the three priests and reiterating their story, some of your critics say that this is more uh, victim blaming and victim shaming and you're doing it with sort of an, an arrogant tone as opposed to taking full responsibility of this for yourself by not removing him sooner from ministry. Well, we didn't have, I get where you're coming from, but we did not feel, you mean removing Father Nowak? Yes. We did not, well, we did ask him to step aside for a while at, at, when we first were looking at these, uh, these concerns that came to us from uh, Matthew Boschanowski. But we did not feel, and you need to know that, as I mentioned, I think there were three days in May where over six and a half hours of uh, interview and discussion went on, uh, led by Steve Halter and Bishop Grosch as the auxiliary bishop uh, with Father Nowak. And uh, we decided it would be good for him to go for evaluation. Uh, eventually, when he refused to go three times, I, I had had it. It's time to put him on leave, but we did not, f f we did not uh, feel or discern before that time that it was uh, necessary to uh, put him on leave. He had not been accused of any kind of 
um, physical, uh, like sexual contact, or any of those kinds of things that would trigger something of that sort. Well, Bishop, in January, the allegation was levied that Father Noah had rummaged through Bojanowski's things, taken that letter. You acknowledge you subsequently found out he was in possession of that letter. How did that conduct not rise to the level of putting him on administrative leave? Well, that's why eventually in, in this complex scenario, that, that is one, of course, of the, of the several reasons when you started to add them over, over time that led us to the decision to put him in administrative leave. But in, the particular reason was so that he could go off for evaluation by objective professionals and explore any and all of those things, okay? And to see where, where's all that coming from and what does it mean for his future possibilities of ministry. So that's really the, that's really the, the answer to that one. Why wasn't Father Beer not sent for a similar assessment? Uh, he has not been at this time. Uh, we shall see going forward what will happen. Again, once again, I am not aware of, I am not aware at this time of any allegations of sexual impropriety between Father Richard and Matthew. None of that has come my way. But he broke his vow of obedience to the bishop, did he not? Did he his promise of obedience? To the bishop. Father Richard? Yes. You mean in this case of releasing the documents? Yes, sir. Well, I, I suppose you could, uh, I suppose you could interpret it that way. Isn't that uh, a firing offense? Well, there would be, there would be, it's not, you know, sometimes people think these things in the Catholic Church are all black and white, but they're not. There's loads of gray. And there are levels, huh? There are levels of, uh, of gravity to these things. And uh, at this point, it has not been my uh, sense that, that it's time for Father Richard to, uh, to be moving in that direction. How did Father Richard explain the contents of the letter to you? I mean, they, we, I'm sure people here have read the letter. You've seen it. It seems to be a love letter. Yeah. A lot of people have said that to me. Apparently, that took us a long time to get that letter. Months. Um, and uh, a lot of people out there, apparently, had seen that letter before I did. It was circulating around. And that, that is the report I heard, or the take I heard on that letter from a number of, a number of lay people who saw it, that it seemed like romantic in tone. It seemed like a love letter. Um, but Father Richard has not explained the letter or the contents of the letter to you? He has explained it, but I, I, think, I think I'd go beyond where I should go to, to give his explanation, I think you need to ask him for that. It's his story, you know, and I don't feel comfortable revealing what he told me about that. But, but, but it's a very, Jay, it's a very legitimate question. Was there disappointment or shame? Excuse me? From you, were you, was there disappointment as the leader of, of the, the Catholic Church uh, in this area? Disappointment or shame in, in his personal conduct? Well, I was, I was surprised. I was very surprised. You mean about the about sending that letter to Matthew? I, I, I mean uh, the letter to uh, yeah to Matthew. Um, yes, it, it did catch me by surprise, to tell you the truth. I mean I had heard rumors about that um, sometime in the past that there was a letter, but obviously you can't you can't move on an even initial investigation about a letter and its contents until you have the letter. Right? And so uh, that's the, kind of the story on that. So is that why you wanted him to take the lead, though? I wanted to well, you know, that. the reason, for, the base, my reason for that was that I know, the, I know the letter is out there. People are talking about it. I know that some of your uh, organizations, some of your stations have that letter. And uh, I just thought that while that is out there brewing, whatever it means, it might be a good thing for Father Richard uh, just a step a bit apart from his work with me. As I mentioned before, it was not administrative leave. Uh, I asked him to consider doing that, and he did. He still is able to uh, celebrate Mass, and which he does, and all of those types of things. But, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, there was some water here. Thank you. So that's basically, I forget, where was I? That's so bright, I can't, who was I talking to? Oh, I'm sorry. What is your name again? Of course, yeah. 
So that's basically the, basically the story there. Did I miss anything in, in answering your question? I may well, have. Well, I, I think, you know, I'm just trying to get an understanding of, of, of the purpose for asking him to take the lead. Was it because, um, obviously, the church has strict rules when it comes to um, sexuality? Uh, was it because you had concerns whether or not he was following those rules? Is that why you wanted him to lead your office? Not, not, not really. No, that was not the reason. I, I thought with, 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 with news that might be coming about that letter, it might be better for him and for the diocese because he's, he's very, very closely uh, perceived as working with me, which he has done and done very well for six years. We must have driven around thousands of miles in western New York going to parishes and confirmation ceremonies and all of that. Uh, we lived in the same residence for six years over six years. We always got along very, very well. Um, most evenings, if we were going to be in, which didn't happen too often because we have a lot of evening events, we would always meet around 5.20 in the afternoon, the two of us, and any guests who were there, and we would have prayer together. Then we might have a glass of wine or something and then sit down for dinner and have uh, just regular conversation people would have. Sometimes friends were there, um, sometimes one or two of his relatives from Poland would be visiting. And we would host them at the bishop's residence too, which I so told Father Bichard when we first began working, my house is your house. And uh, feel free to have guests here. So. Why were reporters hand-selected for this news conference today? Well, I, probably Kathy can answer that better than I can. Well, I think we were gonna have limited space, so we reached out to someone from each entity who we regularly interact with. But wouldn't you leave it up to We have a few more minutes. What level of personal betrayal feels as greatest um, in private audio recording uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it, I, I have to tell you, Jay, it, it totally shocked me. I, I felt like I was hit by a bolt of lightning, kind of emotionally, by it. It was the last thing in the world I ever uh, expected or anticipated in my relationship with Father Richard. And so that's all I can say. I was just I was just stunned by it and dismayed by it, and I I, I just never saw it coming. So, how do you interpret that? That he recorded meetings, apparently several, excuse yeah. me, and then released them at this particular point in time when he's in peril. Seeing how do you interpret that? I I I don't even dare try to interpret it. I I don't know what the dynamics of that might be to tell you the truth. I don't have a sense. And he certainly hasn't talked to me about that. So I, I don't know how to answer the question. If I did, I would, I'd give it a shot, but. Can you truly say with all this happened, despite all of this that's transpired, that still the majority of Catholic Catholic churches behind you? Jeff? Well, I, I haven't taken a poll, but I, I get, believe it or not, you could ask my office staff, I get every week more positive mail Believe it, it sounds like it. I'm making this up, but I'm not. Then I do negative mail. That comes too. Uh, but most of it is, I got two today, two emails from people who are watching this whole thing, and, and they, they, they're not, they're not, they're, they're intelligent people. They're committed to the church. They're, they're distraught about this. And one woman said to me in an email, I don't put you on a pedestal, okay? She said, I don't put anybody on a pedestal, but she said, all of this is just too much. She meant, you know, the, the, the constant, uh, the people who do uh, play the drums for me to ride out of town. So, I mean, there, there are lots of people who kind of look at it with perspective, and uh, that, that helps me a whole lot. I feel, to tell you the truth, and again, as I said, I'm not a masochist. I'm not a person who enjoys suffering and pain. And this is painful to me. Don't get me wrong. It's brought me closer to Christ in my prayer. And if you know me at all, I'm not a pietistic person. But it really has made me pray more deeply and, and feel more united with Christ, this whole situation. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, if I, 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 if, if I really felt I couldn't do it, either 
physically or spiritually or emotionally, or that most of the Catholic people wanted me gone, then I'd have to look at it in a different way. But as your legacy, as you said, if this is your last round of being a bishop, um, if you retire out, why would you want this to be that part of your legacy as you're leaving the Catholic Because I'm, I'm here where I am now. We've all heard the, I suppose it's a cliche, the trite expression, bloom where you're planted. And um, I've had a very, very good ministry as a priest and then almost 20 years as a bishop. And uh, I, I have, I don't say this in any self-affirming way, but simply to point out, I, ha I do have the respect of many of the U.S. bishops. I've asked, been asked to take many leadership positions nationally. Um, I've withdrawn from a couple of those now because I want to focus on our work at renewal and reform and purification. But uh, I, I, I still, f believe it or not, I feel, still feel strong. I hope that doesn't sound arrogant because I have moments when I don't feel strong. And that's when I talk to friends or I spend some time in the chapel. But I, I really believe, um, you know, Catholics believe, and many of you know this, that when we receive a sacrament, whether it's baptism or marriage, or in my case, holy orders, that a special grace from God comes with that sacrament. And I've never believed in that more deeply than I do right now, because I know my still being here is not just me. No, I just trust that it's the Lord trying to help me through this thing, which is grueling. I'm, I, I'll admit that to you. Every every day, I, I, I wonder what's coming next. Okay, one last question, Cam. Uh, <coughs> uh, one last question for, yes, um, for the, the members of your flock who are still, uh, they're waking up every day and maybe seeing the, the news just as you are. What kind of strength or encouragement can you give them as they're reeling through this um, and happening? And thank you for a, for a wonderful question. It's very simple to me, and my prayer tends to be very simple, uh, if, 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 if profound in other ways. My, 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 my prayer for our people is that, first of all, they will keep a priority on praying for and working toward the healing of victims who have been, who have been abused by priests or anyone else, but primarily by priests and ministers of the church, number one. Number two, that they'll keep their focus on Jesus Christ, um, even though there, there's reason for disappointment with the church, uh, not to give up, and to remember that even as we try to work through this terrible crisis that has hurt so many people in our world and in our own Western New York, that the larger mission of the church, which is to bring what Pope Francis calls the joy of the gospel to the world, that has to continue. I still have to be concerned that our youth and young adults receive good uh, formation, good training in the faith, that our Catholic schools are doing what they should do, that we have outreach on the west side and elsewhere to our, to our migrant and refugee families. All of those are the kind of the uh, perennial mission of the church and more. Of course, the worship of God is in there too, big time. And uh, it's my responsibility, working with my priests and others, the laity and the religious and deacons, uh, to make sure even as we deal with a crisis situation now, that we're not losing sight of or commitment to that larger 2,000 year old mission of the church that must go forward um, as, uh, as we move into, I hope, new and better times. Thank so. you everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you all. <coughs> Thank you for good questions. Second time. Credibility. After hearing these tapes, he said there's evidence that you led the right. You mentioned a dangerous priest. Interesting How do you though. Interesting to that? though. He's welcome to his opinion. Uh, interesting that uh, he feels it's okay for him as a politician to tell a religious figure to step down. If I, as a religious figure, told a politician to step down, we'd hear all about, you know, separation of church and state. True. I think so. He's welcome to his opinion. But in a scandal of this nature, if a congressman was faced with this kind of a scandal, I would think more than just you would be asking him to resign. Well, I, I wouldn't feel it was my, I might, I might have a personal conversation, which I would have appreciated with Congressman Higgins. You want to come in and talk to me personally, which would be the time to give it. I would have welcomed it. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>